Good morning. So my name is Luke Heidecke. I'm with Selenia Incorporated. I'm a consultant uh, with them for enterprise uh, companies. I've worked in uh, Germany for our customer there, and also uh, now I work in LA for one of our uh, media companies. Um, I focus a lot on infrastructure automation, uh, DevOps processes, uh, cloud uh, infrastructure, and then sort of the uh, ways of tooling uh, with organizations, um, sort of helping them figure out tooling and uh, processes and uh, people's sort of uh, skills necessary to adopt uh, and move their applications into the cloud. Uh, so today I want to talk a little bit about the uh, challenges of the enterprise, the sort of issues with technical debt um, that we sort of encounter across our, our various customers, uh, the challenges of sort of gathering the state of the current baselines and uh, ways to sort of look at planning uh, your baselines to, uh, that are going to be used in the cloud and then at some point perhaps into uh, containers and things like that. I want to talk about sort of making sure that uh, things are prepared and clear uh, as far as the requirements and processes and things like that as you go forward. Um, the next thing is, is really focusing on uh, foundational images, identifying the various functional, procedural, and security requirements, and building those in layers, um, and then really decomposing those to uh, sort of reduce complexity, um, create a working baseline, and, uh, and also talk a little bit about the strengths of, of immutable images, uh, especially as you move towards containers, but it also, the sort of practices really uh, lend well to clear working baselines within enterprise uh, environment in the cloud. Uh, the next piece is sort of taking that and uh, growing continuous improvement, uh, you know, capture the, the cycle of capture, create, test, and iterate, um, making sure that everything is auditable, uh, understood by all the teams, and manageable by, by uh, teams in a, in a clear, automated uh, process. So the, the customers that I've been working with um, that you know, my colleagues have been working with, there's, it's clear that there's sort of years, this, this burden of years or even decades of technical debt, um, the legacy of sort of past decisions and traditional uh, sort of architectures, uh, old operating systems. Um, I'm sure many of you, my customers running you know, CentOS 6.5, earlier baselines that have to be patched and built upon as soon as you install, there's instantly a need to update and, and change and, and uh, modify um, something that was just freshly installed. Um, so a lot, and I'm sure there's old, even older versions of that still running. I know that there's a lot of people um, uh, and our customers that still have systems that are, are, are precious snowflakes that can't be touched. And a lot of that is making sure that the process is automated and, and fast enough and, and reactive enough where uh, People, you know, application owners and development teams don't feel as paranoid or um, like they have to keep their, their babies intact for, uh, you know, ever. Um, part of that is also sort of capturing the processes, uh, the security, organizational, the sort of history of processes built up uh, over time, uh, not necessarily aligning with baselines within OpenStack, within public clouds, um, or especially within sort of Docker uh, images, things like that. Um, it's, I know, very difficult to sort of take those and align, and align those various requirements and break them down into workable baselines that, that uh, make sense with an a fully automated uh, image build. Um, the, the other thing we've seen a lot also is documentation. Um, not fully documenting, uh, the documents not reflecting the current state, um, because it's painful if it's not automated, um, and uh, sort of especially new people or new projects spinning up, if the documentation isn't clear, it can be very painful for new engineers. Um, one of the other pieces I noticed, I, I saw on Twitter, the uh, issue with sort of the 10x engineer, an engineer that comes in and does work, and then they require 10 times more engineers just to kind of come up and clean after that engineer um, <laughs> and figure things out in the future. So it's, it's a, a lot of our sort of pain points for customers has been uh, realizing that 
automating and fixing and documenting things from the start uh, in a clear and concise manner, even if it means that uh, sort of you're simplifying uh, um, a little bit more than you think you have to, the, the initial release, it's really helpful and important that you have those processes from the start so you don't have to um, you know, clean up and, and send an army of engineers in to clean up uh, later for that kind of thing. Uh, one of the other challenges is the sort of idea of parallel and divergent baselines. So that, you know, whether it's an application team, uh, you know, or, or other sort of operations teams or, or, or locations within an organization, uh, may, maybe starting out with a, a common baseline, you know, back when 6.5 was first released in 2012, um, or I think actually earlier than that. Um, and you know, everybody likes the little Snowflake system, so we sort of see a lot of teams creating something on the baseline, and then it gets handed off to maybe a security team, and they do some manual installs, and then it's sent back to another team, and, and, and then suddenly it's diverged, and the system hasn't even uh, gone to production yet. So a lot of, a, a lot of this stuff is making, it, making sure that within the tool chain, and the processes for, for baseline creation that uh, it's clear enough to all those teams and that everybody is held to the same standards. Uh, one of the other challenges there is the timelines, right? So if, if, those, th if those processes and tool chains aren't um, uh, you know, usable by all the teams, uh, people start to make sacrifices in, 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 uh, in sort of the name of, of shipping it now and we need to make sure that those tools uh, all sort of take that into account. Um, and, and that you know, sort of organizational oversight, that there's, there's uh, the control of, of, of baselines and these images is uh, maintained in, a, in sort of orderly fashion that's, that's, uh, that's, that's common across all the teams that might be uh, collaborating on this sort of thing. The next piece there, uh, so the requirements. Um, really taking uh, and decomposing what you have in your stack currently, what you're moving into the cloud, or, or if you're fortunate enough to be able to do greenfield deployments. Uh, some of our customers are just doing, uh, you know, greenfield deployments and um, like microservices and Kubernetes, um, and they're giving sort of a good opportunity to have a new greenfield deployment where they're sort of taking, uh, they're they're leaving their legacy systems and they're saying, okay, that's maybe still a data source, maybe still uh, some other backend systems, but uh, we're going to really make sure that our new systems are focused on the best way to do it within uh, sort of the microservice uh, uh, compute environments um, that they're trying to implement for tomorrow. Um, so taking the various application containers, uh, application dependencies, uh, environments, uh, environmental configurations and locations and things like that, uh, breaking those down as functional requirements, the, uh, and then and it goes into security. So making that part of, uh, part of the integrated process, that's a, a lot of the problem that we also have at uh, a customer, especially in finance and government and et cetera, is uh, this mountain of uh, security requirements that need to be integrated into an overall baseline, and instead they're treated as a layer on top and not considered as far as the sort of the systematic approach to baseline creation. Um, so making sure that those are decomposed, that the, you look at, uh, there's a common understanding of what the requirements mean, and this goes for all of these pieces, and really looking at implementations that make sense for an automated cloud um, deployment. Um, and then from there, really, we, we look a lot at you know, things like making sure that host-based firewalls, whether it's SC Linux or AppArmor with Ubuntu, uh, making sure that those technologies are also thought of in a systematic approach so that you're not um, sending it off to the security team just to do a bunch of work, that um, those are really automated and included in the baseline as well. Um, the next piece is sort of the procedural, making sure that you know, a lot of our work has been with customers figuring out um, you know, it seem, things tend to be, some of these decisions some team seem to be in silos where, uh, you know, it's the, it's the network team or the engineering team that, that comes down from high and decides to make, do a tool or a, uh, a component within the baseline and not keeping in mind how it's actually going to be used within development, test, the entire sort of application lifecycle into deployment. Um, and that goes kind of into the monitoring and management too, seeing 
really evaluating the tools that you're using uh, to make sure that they can be installed in this sort of fashion um, and that they're common throughout the systems. And if, if it's not something that can be common within the application stack, that it's not used or that you look evaluate a different tool. Um, that goes for logging metrics or even sec you know, security monitoring, et cetera. So from there, I want to talk a little bit about sort of how we've worked with customers to decompose that stack and then start building um, into a usable cloud image. So the big thing is starting with the minimal set of, for your baseline, whether you choose Red Hat, Ubuntu, uh, making sure that you go with the minimal and it's that sort of, uh, you know, Ubuntu was talking about the, some of the snappy stuff also, really only using what you need to use for your, you know, what you need to have as dependencies for the rest of your application stack. And that the baseline should be portable across functions so that you're not having a baseline for every single application or functional team. That, uh, that you really, through that, you, you reduce the complexity, right? So that you're, um, you're not having to maintain, you can focus efforts. Um, part of that there too for us has been recommending customers really focus on separating out environmental and location um, configurations from these baselines. So not locking yourself into uh, this is our uh, you know, West Coast or this is our Europe deployment, but we have a single cohesive baseline and we store things maybe in uh, tools like uh, console or etcd. Uh, CompD also is another great tool. Um, and uh, you know, this especially is nice if you're preparing now uh, as our customers start using um, so microservices, Kubernetes, et cetera, is it uh, lends itself well to those sorts of things also. Um, certainly, Redis Zookeeper uh, in, in the past to customers have also uh, used some of those tools, but uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, it's nice if, if the tool is purpose-built for you um, in that regard. Uh, the, other, the other piece we look at is the reuse of components. Um, making sure that that single image catalog is uh, uh, focused by a team, and then it's it's not spread throughout an organization, um, and and not siloed between use cases, so that uh, the you know, interdepartmental baseline something like that can people can kind of flow between areas, and you can focus on start going towards service teams, and y you're not um, having to relearn a lot of this uh, uh, thing as people move across the organization. Um, and, and that kind of goes also into building for production, so that as you, um, you know, carry these images through the application lifecycle uh, during development, test, and production, that there's no wasted effort um, in this, uh, you know, each of these teams all touching it. So um, the, the next sort of thing is the, the baseline now, um, making sure that you're not reversing changes in the future. You're not having to back out patches, things like that, um, as you go forward. That kind of talks a little bit about the minimal Ubuntu images, minimal CentOS, Red Hat, um, going into some of the container operating systems like CoreOS, uh, you know, certainly Project Atomic, uh, tools like that. Uh, but even if you don't choose to use those, using that same sort of methodology where uh, you take uh, the very minimal set of dependencies for your application stack and then build from there. Um, the, if you're not familiar, CoreOS and Project Atomic, those tools are very container uh, focused where it has the, the base uh, sort of uh, user land um, set of, of, of uh, services and everything on top that you build it runs in a container. Um, so th that's very interesting, but you know, using that same sort of thought process of the baseline that you, you keep everything as minimal as possible and then build on top of that with your application stack. Uh, again, building in security, uh, integrated with the baseline, um, making sure that whether you use CS benchmarks or other tools, that those are built in and that those considerations are, are, are included from the start of your baseline. Um, that that the security configuration team isn't held to a different or separate standard from the rest of, of the teams that are, that are uh, contributing to the baseline and application stack. Um, th that, and that kind of goes into the, the management and the testing uh, being automated, that you're not sort of um, you know, layering something on like security and that that's not verifiable. And every piece of this should be tested and should be, um, uh, you know, 
verified after the fact. So um, the, the sort of this, the manual steps that we've seen uh, just m makes for headache later with troubleshooting uh, e or developers and things like that. So it, it, it blends it nice itself nicely to so that sort of idea of building for production. Um, that also goes into sort of the integrity of images, building towards immutable images. It's a great thing within containers, uh, keeping things uh, from the start, and if you change your baseline, um, start thinking about uh, redeploying services and it, uh, ins rather than uh, this constant iteration of a service that was deployed, you know, uh, not the service, but uh, an image that might have been deployed years past. Um, it really sort of lends itself well to making sure that uh, the integrity of the image and, and the system uh, can be maintained throughout deployment. Uh, the other thing is the security updates being timely. So if, if these are all automated processes, uh, automated installs and tests, throughout the entire thing, rather than sending off a VM to a t you know, an, a, an automated t uh, you know, a test team that runs their checklist of 4,000 different tests and, and maybe only gets through a quarter of them, um, that these things are included as uh, you know, a cohesive uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline. Um, so that you know, as, the as new dependencies come on board, as new services come on board, that uh, you don't have to wait around for the latest patches, the latest um, uh, you know, changes, things like that. You, you're guaranteed um, a fully automated pipeline there. Um, so we'll go into the next. Talk about creating that foundation, some of the tools we've used with teams um, and, and organizations that, we've, that we have uh, as customers right now. So the criteria for configuration management that I, I sort of like to think about as we talk, because we're very fairly agnostic about which tools, um, because organizations are different. There's there's different levels of language proficiency. There's different levels of you know if if for example if you're a Python shop, um, it may not make sense to force in a configuration management tool uh, that your developers and your and and your admins and various teams are going to have to use that might be Ruby. Um, so focusing on um, the language, uh, having a declarative language that says what it should be, not how to get there, so that it's clearly understood by all of the teams what, uh, uh, what the end goal should be. And that goes well to also being able to write tests against that so it's very clear, um, you know, the make it so, and then verifying that, uh, that it actually is so. Um, the the agentless, I, I mentioned, uh, making sure that you can take that same configuration, that you're not changing how you install software or patches or uh, you know configurations uh, one way at at bake time, and then changing that and doing a different process and having to um, sort of duplicate those processes in some other system once it comes online. So you're de you're deploying that, uh, and, and you're enforcing from the start of the build. Uh, rather than having to maintain two different baselines of configuring or enforcing the same sort of uh, configurations. Um, and then w with that, taking those configurations and making sure that it can be easily version controlled. That's in a format you can check into Git, like SVN, w whatever method you use, it, it needs to be version controlled and tr traceable back to uh, when an image was created, what was the state at that time. Uh, the, you know, really treating everything as code. The, the infrastructure is code thing, and within DevOps, it's really uh, recommended, and it really has helped customers to to not have to. Um, you know, some some customers have used systems that are very difficult to version control. You said it, do it one time, and it's a lot of it's more legacy systems, and really recommending. Uh, Really, we've tried to recommend customers to, to move outside of that sort of old paradigm and move to tools um, like Chef or Puppet, Ansible, um, that can sort of lend itself well to this sort of deal. Um, and, and Bash probably doesn't, uh, yeah? Yeah, uh, so if I understand correctly, we always uh, move to the approach that we use the features, then the uh, configuration management tools like Puppet, Chef, they should also be built for this, right? They, they, they don't have any. Yes. Yeah, so if you if you move, his question was if if you're moving towards immutable images, um, 
you know, doesn't, that kind of removes the need for that, uh, those configuration management tools after the fact if it's immutable in the first place. And that's exactly correct. So, um, but I, I think there's still that need for having um, that, just, that declarative language and not uh, a mess, I mean, if, uh, a mess of bash to, to describe uh, that that's not necessarily um, understood by everyone. Um, and and a as you sort of capture these layers of the images and you might move to Docker files and things like that, uh, you know, and you already have things deconstructed. It certainly is easier just to go to um, Bash, but it's you know I think there's still an, um, needs to be um, sort of emergence of a better way of describing some of these things, um, and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> So it depends. If you're going to something like an immutable image with Docker, um, you might not have an agent running at all, and it might purely just be sort of a, 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 a check that, that the configuration is still as it is, um, that you're not you know, backing anything out. Um, but in cloud, you know, if you're on OpenStack and, you're, and it's a, sort of a more traditional virtual machine environment, you may still have the agent running um, to uh, you know, enforce certain environmental changes. It's certainly a, uh, not a bad way to, to sort of take uh, configuration, you know, template configuration files, if, even if you store key values in something like console or CD, still being able to sort of take some of those and, and, and insert those, uh, overlay some of those configuration settings in, in more traditional systems. Um, I, I, it'll be interesting to see how that kind of plays out the next you know, year, six months, if there's better ways of, of, of taking some of those uh, because uh, my, my big concern is making sure that you're not duplicating effort, right? So if you're building uh, a, a very base, minimal Ubuntu image, making sure that you're not doing it in a different, you're taking that same, uh, you know, uh, image, using it as your, as your uh, base image for your Docker files. Um, so, you know, as, uh, that's where the, sort of the agentless sort of really lends itself nicely, is that you can still build that in the same fashion and reuse if you're going into Docker, et cetera. And hopefully there's better ways of doing that. It's a good uh, open source project, <laughs> um, little weekend project to sort of look at more declarative languages for describing some of the baselines. Um, but I think if you do it right, with, especially with Docker files, you're not over complicating, um, uh, you shouldn't be, if, if your Docker file or you know, you, what you're layering on top of your image in, in microservices sense, if it's pages long, there probably could be ways to simplify and, and uh, uh, minima minimize what you're actually doing to the image from there. Um, so that'll be kind of interesting. Does that kind of answer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. The other piece, yeah, you know, testable. Um, I'll go into some of what that means, but uh, you know, being able to make sure that it's clear, concise, that the end state is 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 uh, known, and that your uh, you know requirements are captured, and that you're actually being able to verify what you put within the image. Um, so, wanted to talk a little bit about once you sort of have these things captured, you have your your you know uh, your your baseline declared, uh, building it in an automated fashion, taking that information and building it for various clouds. Most of our customers all run some sort of hybrid model where they have an internal OpenStack cloud. Um, they're running some things, maybe perhaps on Amazon or, or Google, um, and, and now in Docker, and wanting to make sure that you can make an image once and, uh, and kind of carry it through. There's older tools, uh, you know, Disk Image Builder that was part of the, or is part of the OpenStack um, sort of umbrella, Oz, and really Packer is sort of, uh, kind of identified as seems to be sort of the best tool for the job. Um, the nice thing with Packer is that it's easily, you know, that goes back to the easily understood templates. Um, writing once uh, and being able to build on for VMware, Amazon, you know, QCows, Google, uh, and, and Docker, um, Docker images. Uh, it really helps to be able to not have to uh, you know, have scripts and not automation for five different platforms. It's really easy for, um, it's been really beneficial for our customers to be able to use this tool. Um, and 
kind of, the nice thing too is that, you know, so the support of Vagrant, um, a lot of my time is spent on my laptop, whether it's traveling or, or the customer site, and being able to take that same image and run it within Vagrant um, or within Docker. Um, I've moved mostly to where it's uh, like all my local development and, and builds are done in Docker. Being able to use that same baseline throughout is really helpful so that, again, from the entire application cycle, you're using your same exact baseline and you're building it for production. Uh, one of the issues there too, oh, and the, the other nice thing is, sorry, we'll go back, it's the, that, that part of the larger CI-CD pipeline um, is that you know, a couple of customers when we first moved in and, and sort of d d were capturing requirements and talking with them about processes, the, pro the process of getting an image, image baseline that was up to date or for a new system, um, you know, was at best, you know, a week. Um, and even if it's a, f a few hours and I'm doing testing and I'm trying to iterate over and, and, and um, you know, change something about the baseline, if I have to wait, uh, you know, hours to figure out what, my cha what change has happened, uh, it's frustrating and uh, <laughs> my patience wears thin on it. So having that sort of automated process with something like Packer, being able to build locally as you would build within um, a larger CICD pri uh, pipeline has been really helpful for us. Uh, the next thing, as I spoke about, testability, making sure that when you choose tools that they're testable. Um, using tools like uh, server spec with spec infra, billing, it, it allows you to take Ruby, um, our spec tests, and uh, test against your infrastructure. So get information about your infrastructure, uh, be able to take uh, you know, declarative statements like it must be uh, have Apache installed, it must be running on port 80, uh, it must uh, have these configuration uh, uh, statements. Uh, that's all available within server spec. And uh, the Kitchen t CI allows you to take um, those service spec tests, run it in a test furnace that's uh, runnable on, uh, we run it on Amazon EC2, being able to do OpenStack, Docker, et cetera, um, and not have it be this sort of uh, manual smoke test process. Um, I don't know about you guys, but my days of uh, running checklists like that um, of, and, and manually doing a lot of these uh, uh, verification steps are kind of over. Um, the next piece, uh, version control. Just making sure that there's a, uh, that level of historical information, um, that you can roll back uh, images, that you're sa not only saving the configuration that went into the images, but that you can also um, store your images in some sort of artifact repository. Um, even if you, you, know, you don't need to keep five years, but some, some level of, st uh, of rollback to, uh, for at least what's in production to know what, what's running where and, and uh, being able to recreate those sorts of environments is really nice. Um, and also making sure that there's some, civil, uh, some level of image integrity um, is certainly nice. Tools uh, like uh, Artifactory, um, Nexus, uh, we've also used for uh, our Docker images and other, uh, other, other baseline images have been really helpful with that. So from there, we, we really look at uh, improving and iter you know, iterating over improvement. Um, moving towards the immutable uh, application images, um, sort of uh, enabling the, the sort of zero configuration drift. It's very obvious if, if, you, um, if, if there's no changes to a baseline that there should be no changes, and you can very easily report and, and audit against that. Um, it's a great foundation for creating you know, container images doc, uh, within Docker. Um, and the more sort of automated these processes are, and, and the more uh, quick turn, you know, the quicker turnaround uh, as, uh, that can be enabled, uh, really helps you know, with decisions of, of you know, pain points for how, how difficult it is, is it to redeploy an application or a service? How difficult is it to move to things like A-B testing where I'm bringing up, um, you know, a, another instance of, of, of a, a service with a new version? I, I don't want to have to wait around and, and I, I don't think most development teams that we've worked with, uh, you know, certainly having to uh, worry about how long it's going to take for new versions or, or um, new images to be created. Uh, it, you know, that sort of timeline really uh, affects some decision making. So the quicker, the, the better, and, and the more likely people, teams are going to actually be able to use the, these, uh, these baselines. Um, and and it, as, you're, as you're sort of getting those, the, 
the full test harness in, um, I've seen a lot of power being able to um, easily test what, what effects on the baseline, how it affects downstream images. So being able to compose uh, your application stack, try it out with a new version of your baseline, and, and then sort of um, uh, easily see how that affects this version of Apache or, um, or any service that you might be running. So fr from there, I just wanted to you know, uh, talk about, again, remind, really focus on overcoming those, the app, you know, the baseline drift of having you know, 10 different parallel baselines, uh, reducing those sort of uh, silos between teams and, and baselines, minimizing that uh, complexity, um, considering the sort of baking uh, process of, of when you first create an image, uh, be very deliberate on how you're going to, or what you're actually putting in that baseline, uh, and making sure that there's the duplication and um, uh, sort of simple configuration with those images uh, is, is all thought about from the start, and you're not having to go back and, and, and sort of uh, rework endlessly. Um, you know, people want to sort of create the baselines and not have that be your entire career at some point. Um, using the right tools has also been really Im important to uh, remind um, organizations, making sure that the you know the teams that are going to be using these tools, the organization you know structure, um, the the best practices for these tools are all sort of taken into account, um, and it sort of seems obvious at first, but um, making sure that it's the decisions just like your applications and and your team shouldn't be operating in a silo that the you know you really shouldn't be making the tool decisions in silos either. So um, you know making sure that at the very least the the you know operations developer tests security teams are all taken to an account um, when choosing the tool chain, uh, automating and verifying, making sure that. You know, the configuration management is declarative. Uh, it's easily understood by the, the, by the maintainers and the, the people that will be auditing these images, uh, making sure that they're versioned and testable. Uh, and then really building for production, making sure that there's one image that's used, that's, that's easy, that, that meets the needs, that can be used throughout the entire life cycle um, and, and not, uh, you know, added on right, you know, the last uh, day right before production. Uh, and one of the things I want to make sure you guys know, uh, at 1.50 p.m. this afternoon, uh, Seth Fox and Spencer Smith, also from Selenia, will be talking about Packer, doing a demo on it, showing some, some example configurations. Um, hope you can make it. It's in Wakaba. And also the basic we are hiring. Um, we do a lot of travel uh, <laughs> all over the world, consulting so about this, the same sorts of problems. Um, love to talk with you. And uh, any questions? We got a a little bit. Anything? Okay. Ah. Yeah. Oh. So. So, so basically, it would be uh, in our company, we uh, really never whole process for considering where we need to go for the job. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was, uh, how, how many of our customers are actually looking, uh, actually implementing sort of the immutable uh, images right now? Um, the the customer I'm working, really focusing on for the most part right now, uh, is heavily in invested in that, uh, uh, especially as they move to microservices within Kubernetes and Docker containers. Uh, they're they're uh, they're very committed to to doing that within the organization to make sure that uh, all the benefits are <laughs> gathered there. The, so the obstacles of, of moving towards mutable uh, images, uh, making sure that requirements are clear, <laughs> what needs to be, uh, you know, making sure that all the sort of invested parties understand what needs to be done, making sure that there's also buy-off from uh, the, main, the maintainers and the operators of, of uh, and I think as, as organizations move more towards the sort of service teams rather than developer teams and maintenance teams and sort of separating them out. Uh, 
I, I think that's a really good step. Um, and it kind of, it, as long as there's buy-off, that um, you know, the days of uh, allowing people to come in with some sort of, um, you know, one-off bash script or, <laughs> or, or hack together Python uh, uh, script to, to change something in production because uh, it needs to be done right now, uh, making sure that, that it's clear with it and it's enforced within the organization that that's not the way things are, are happening. So I, that's one of the biggest challenges of making sure that the, for, for us that I've seen so far is that uh, um, there's buy-off from the entire team <laughs> and, that, and that people are going to stick to it when uh, even if it's, it seems like challenging, but I think you know if people, with automation, with that sort of verification, with with a process that's agile enough, and a set of tools that that uh, you can turn around quick enough, uh, it, I think it becomes m very obvious to teams really qu very quickly that um, they don't necessarily have to sacrifice that sort of tooling uh, in in the name of expediency um, as as long as it's enforced, right? <laughs> Do you know anyone in SOS um, you know, using the approach without breaking the normally? I mean, having big. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, anyone moving into immutable approach without breaking the monolith? I mean, uh, having uh, big images. Uh, and, and moving them into production and uh, considering on the implications of uh, frequent updates? Uh, no, not, we don't have any, um, I, I don't believe we, we have any customers that are looking at sort of um, taking the, the sort of monolithic approach. I, I think even if, even if, you don't, if you're not doing microservices, uh, taking, um, I, I, we're not taking yeah. the monolith approach. We we have a problem. We have a large legacy uh, enterprise applications. Yeah. And they happen to be monolithic. Yeah. Um, I think it, it depends on it does if the, if the architecture supports being able to redeploy. This you know it depends on the f the frequency right of 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 change, and if if there's a way to get. Um, you know, it, it depends, you know, so, so many things are like, if, if the applications can support that, if the rest of, if the services downstream, if it's, if it's something back end, can the other services uh, sort of um, accept that sort of way of doing things? Um, you know, certainly if you have uh, other tools or, or um, those monitoring agents that you sort of, in, in a lot of traditional enterprises sort of, a uh, collection of like five different agents running on a system for, you know, your metrics, your logging, your, you know, all these different things. It, uh, you know, some tools just don't expect that sort of um, way of doing things. So, but it'd be interesting, to, uh, uh, yeah, interesting challenge. <laughs> but I, I think you can still get cl like closer to that sort of deal, um, to, to, to keeping things uh, immutable. Uh, Without, you know, uh, there might be compromise there. <laughs> uh, it'd be an interesting problem. Is it a back, a back end sort of application or? It's all tiered. Okay. Hmm. Back end, mid tier, server. All on the same server or? Yeah. Ah. Hundreds of servers. Hundreds, yeah. <laughs> what is your how monolithic? <laughs> interesting. Any other questions? Okay, thanks a lot, guys. Have a good one.